just because you can use your hand as a hammer doesn't mean you should, okay? You might be able to hammer in a nail, sort of. Not the point. Not the point at all. That's not what your hand is for. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and we're going to be talking about Julie Roy's theology. All right, coffee, my lovely sidekick. I roast my own beans. If you're ever curious, I like South American coffees the best. All right, so we are looking at <clears throat> Julie Roy's theology. And I want to be fair. I really do. Because here's the thing. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to just slander and insult and all this other stuff. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. And I hope I don't do that. And if I do, sometimes I get a little worked up. Uh, you know, please, please point it out or, hey, that was a little harsh or something like that. I might be too kind today. So I might upset some other people. And that's, you know, that's fine. We all have our different opinions. But let my personality, if you will, be separate as much as we can. Uh, each of us, ultimately, especially as followers of Christ, we do, we are called to sharpen each other. So Julie says she's a believer. I know some people have differences of opinions. I'm going to go, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt. Um, I know I have some friends who do videos and done videos and uh, they might differ. That's fine. That being said, she's done several things uh, on her YouTube channel. They're posted there, uh, interviews and preaching and also, she did a Q and A here. Yeah. Um, well, I think the Me Too movement, in many ways, you know, there might be a variety of opinions on it. I think, in many ways, it was it's been really positive. I think we're listening. Okay. So no. But let's listen. Well, let's just listen. In a culture where women have a voice that they haven't had for a really long time, um, can it? You know, can it be abused? Everything's abused. So, of course, it will be, and it has been, and I'm sure, you know, it will continue to be. But I think we are living in a moment where women have a chance to speak in <clears throat> um, the ways that they've been oppressed in culture and abused. And I think that's a good thing. I, I think the Me Too movement can be very positive. And I think as a church, it's good to embrace that, the positive parts of it. Um, feminism, um, the thing that's hard about feminism is that it's an ism. It's an ideology. And you can't... Okay, so real quick, though. <clears throat> excuse me sorry um you could say that about anything you could say that about critical race theory you could say that about evolution you could say that about materialism you could say that about gnosticism she'll talk about gnosticism uh in a little bit and so me too actually isn't good at all uh now if you want to say you know women having a voice yeah that's great i'm fine that's yeah sure i've got three daughters i've got a great wife uh, i understand that, that women are people no one's saying they're not uh, they're we're both made in God's image, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. Praise God. And for that, sure, Julie, I agree. But for me too, it it was it was accusations. And we saw this with, you know, Brett Kavanaugh. We saw this with multiple other people. And then how it reverted with, you know, say Joe Biden, um, because the left in particular, who especially runs the media and so on, only wants to highlight and focus on certain people. But this isn't new. I mean, they did this to Clarence Thomas the first actual black, uh, not Katanji Brown, uh, first black Supreme Court justice back in the early 90s. I maybe don't remember that, but he was assaulted and assailed with multiple sex allegations then. This is even before you know Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky and all that stuff. But Me Too did is say, yeah, women have a voice and it doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong. It's just the accusation is what matters. That is heinous and wrong. It's a lie. That's not good extricate yourself from the ideology I've, I've seen you know there's this jesus feminism that's really popular now you know, if you've read sarah bessie's book called jesus feminist or whatever um and on the call it cover of the book it says the, just the radical notion that women are people too so i guess if you're not a feminist you don't think women are people too i mean it's, it's propaganda I, it really is that's not what feminism is it never okay so julie says by her own lips she's not a feminist okay so julie's not a feminist great um, she says she's not an egalitarian. She's a sacramentalist, which we'll look at here in a moment. But I think that question <clears throat> actually gets to something much deeper. And this is, this is why I call myself a sacramentalist. A sacrament is really just a physical symbol that reveals a spiritual or a deeper reality. And our bodies are important. We live in a culture that says our bodies mean absolutely nothing, right? 
you can have a male body, but if you feel like you're a female, then you can become a female, right? There's no difference. There's no difference between male and female. So if you want to switch roles, if a mother, you know, if a father wants to be a mother, a mother wants to be a father, they can do that. And there's nothing to that. That's actually rooted. I'm going to make this actually. Okay. So right there, that's good, right? She's calling out the transgender nonsense. That's good. Right. And, I, and I'm, and I'm thankful for that, that she's not capitulating. That's good. <clears throat> Philosophical, but that's rooted. That that whole idea. If you trace it back, you can you can trace it back to a second century philosophy called Gnosticism. And essentially, what the Gnostics believed was that the physical world was bad and deceptive. And in fact, they have an entire creation narrative because God couldn't have created the physical realm because the physical is all bad. So God has to be a little bit bad, right? So God has a son. His son is evil, and his son creates the physical world. And so we're kind of trapped inside our bodies. But each of us have this divine spark inside of us. What does it sound like? We have this divine spark inside of us. And salvation comes from discovering your true self, which may be completely at odds with your body that might be deceiving you. All right? Right. So that's good. She's going through and saying, this is Gnosticism. And that is that is true. The Gnostics probably even were around in the late first century uh, where John the Apostle's writing. But that's another story. Uh, she's, she's overall very correct. And again, I, I want to be kind. I really do. And, and you should want to be kind, too. And you might already be wanting to drop me a comment and saying you're a heretic or you're too kind or whatever. Uh, or how dare you attack Julie Royce? You're attacking her. I'm not attacking her. Stop. Just shut up. Stop. I'm not attacking her. We're looking at somebody's theology. You can look at my theology. Look at what I believe. Go to my church's website. Watch a video. Respond. Ask a question. Okay? Now, I'm not in this q and I might drop this and say, hey, Julie, what do you think? Uh, but regardless, she's saying Gnosticism. My body. And, and we live in this world today. And even, even conservative Christians... Christ followers, you know, Bible lovers. So we, it's God's word, right? Not an idol. We'll look at that another time. Uh, 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 we look at this, but so so often we think, oh, but my body doesn't really matter that much. This world isn't my home. It doesn't matter. Uh, except, meh. But God is creating a new heavens and a new earth. We just looked at community group recently um, with um Acts 10, I, I'm preaching through Acts and Peter's hungry, right? So Cornelius has a vision and he's a Gentile. Peter has the vision as well. In the whole midst of that rise, Peter killing it. He says, Peter's hungry. He goes down. He does this whole thing. He invites people in. They dine. They eat. There's all this symbolism. Food is a very physical thing. It's not a spiritual thing at all. Now there's spiritual food and we understand that. But that's not what we're talking about. The scripture is very clear talking about physical food, physical body. You have a one flesh union with your husband and wife, right? That's why having sex outside of marriage is so heinous and it bonds people together. And when you do that, you rip the bond apart so much more, you know, oh, he broke up with me. Oh, and it's like, well, did you have sex? Well, of course we did, you know, and it's so bad. Whereas if you date, maybe even for however long, and it's just not quote unquote working out, you say, hasta luego, see you later not that big of a deal because you didn't have that one flesh union. They got torn and ripped to bits. That's the big difference. So the flesh matters. So she's correct in this area uh, as well. Let's listen a little bit more and we'll just see what else she's got. The transgender movement right there. It's all Gnosticism. The church, even if you look at the Nicene Creed, some of these early creeds of the church were actually written in part to combat Gnosticism. Yeah, that's the true. Gnostics denied the incarnation of Christ because how could God become human? How could he take on an evil body? So they would deny that. It was a heresy of the church. Christians have never, ever accepted Gnosticism. Christians have always understood that the body is important and it speaks something. It says something. It's a walking theology. It shows us something about God. If you want to know something about the nature of what it means to be a man, look at your body. Look at your body. It tells you something. If you want to know something about the nature of what it means to be a woman, what's the essence of femininity? Receiving. What our body does and so our bodies are important Receive. you want to know if men can be equally mothers look at your body can you nurse no nope. you know now we know science is telling us all sorts of things we know now that when a woman nurses a child when you have that skin-to-skin -skin contact that this oxytocin is released and there's this incredible bonding that happens with a child when a mother breastfeeds her child a man can't do that a man doesn't carry a child for nine months and I want to say something that might be very offensive to our culture, but I... See, that was already offensive. And this, I think this video is from 2018, so we don't have the whole full-blown craziness that we have now with, you know, pregnant men emojis and other just nonsense. But Julie's on the wrong side of history, right? 
according to some people. Incredibly offensive for men to think that they can do what I can do as a mother. It's incredibly offensive for men to think what they can they they can do what she can do as a mother. And, and that's true. Now, it's not just offensive, though. It's not just offensive to her. It's offensive to God, right? Because God made us. Now, I understand she's obviously she's not denying Christ or anything like that here. But it's just to be super crystal clear. That's what's happening. So. I don't think men can do it. I was made to be a mother. Well. Okay, so we're going to stop that one there. I don't think men can do it. No, no, no. Julie, let's be a little even more clear. Men cannot do it. I cannot have a baby. I cannot ovulate. I cannot nurse. I don't care if there's like one-tenth of one percent of like, if a baby suckles enough, some sort of milk might be produced. What about all the other women who have breasts, who do nurse immediately? That's the design, Right. Just because you can use your hand as a hammer doesn't mean you should, okay? You might be able to hammer in a nail, sort of. Not the point. Not the point at all. That's not what your hand is for. Your hand is to hold the hammer. All right. Last one. Last one. And this is in the actual um, YouTube, in the, the old YouTube because I had, had to clip those other ones just because of this talk is like 40 some odd minutes long. So she's asked, what's the difference between a man and a woman in the audience and roles in the church? Yeah, great question. Um, it's much I actually don't call myself a complementarian or an egalitarian. I call myself a sacramentalist. And that's because nobody knows what that means. <laughs> and that way you won't put me in a box. But um, honestly... Okay, so first of all, yeah, like we don't want to be in a box. Nobody wants to be in a box. I get it. Like, and we all think we're in the middle, and we're not. Like, there's always people to our left, there's always people to our right, and but we, everybody wants to be in the middle politically, religiously, spiritually, you know, moderately. You know, I'm not really in debt, I'm not really super rich. You know, there's always rich people, there's always more poor people, there's always smarter people, there's always dumber people. So that's just kind of natural human nature, I guess you could say. Close this out, or last little bit. I think I think both those camps have blind spots. Um, I would say the complementarian church tends to focus so much on sexual roles, but often when I ask people who call themselves complementarian, well, why did God even create male or female? Why? Was it just so we could do different things? Well, yeah. Things you could tell half the population not to do certain things. I mean, is that why? Okay. So first of all, sex roles. No, I, I've been I've been part of. So I pastor a church now, and I've been part of three. Two and a half, <laughs> uh, three. I've been members at two other churches for several years each. And then I've been part of another church for about six months. Um, none of them ever were like, men can do this. Women can't do this. Men can do this. Women can't do this. Women can do this. Men can't do this. Like that's not, she talks about the female body and the male body. Well, God made both, right? He made the roles and we'll look here at some scripture in a moment. He made the roles for men and women to do different things like, she unashamedly says women can have babies. Men can have babies. Well, here's the thing, Jules, you can't preach, right? The same God who made the same God who made you to be able to nurse and to carry a baby, ovulate and everything else made the same God to make me preach to lead a church because I'm a man. You're a woman. And I know that chafes against society and that chafes even against Julie Royce or even Beth Moore, who's tight with her, who's also now in the Anglican church because she left the SBC because, well, she can't preach, at least according to some people in the SBC. And so, but is that according to the SBC? No, it's according to scripture, right? So again, hear me closely. The same God that made women carry babies in the physical made men to preach the word of God in the physical. Now, both have spiritual elements. I understand that. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. But ultimately, the proclamation of the gospel is to come from men's lips, particularly in the gathered body of believers. Share the gospel, 
evangelism, missions, all that other stuff. But we're talking about the orderly, because remember, God is an orderly God. The moon and the sun and the stars and the this, everything is set in proper order. Acts 17, God has made the certain boundaries. He set the waters. That's why there's not going to be global catastrophe flooding again. God promised that there's not going to be that. Okay? We should have, Florida should already be underwater, according to Al Gore. Yet it's not. Why? Because God has set the boundaries for the sea to say no more. Furthermore, he has set nations and people and everything else to do X, Y, or Z. God made women do this, men do this. Yet, Julie Royce doesn't, she doesn't like that, right? And so we're going to see a little bit more closely here. And if they don't have an answer, and I feel like there's kind of a missing the forest for the trees. So, but we do have an answer. God wanted to. That's why. Like, that's the answer. But a lot of times people don't like that. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Like we're so into what we can do and not do, but we haven't figured out why God made us the way we are. The egalitarians, on the other hand. Again, we're not so into doing what we can and cannot, can and cannot do. Not every man should preach. Okay. Not every man probably can preach. Not every man is called to preach. And again, we're talking specifically about the gathered body, the leading of a local congregation as a shepherd. Right? Just like there's one shepherd of a flock of sheep. right? Jesus uses a hundred sheep and a shepherd and this and go after them and so on and so forth. Right? It's not just a matter of, well, you know, anybody can come in. No, under shepherds, all these, no. The wolves come in. No, no. The shepherd is the flock, the leader of the flock. That's what it is. And I feel like they deny that there's any good and beautiful reasons between male and female. Again, yeah. why did God make us male and female for just to be interchangeable? I mean, why? Is it just for right? Well, procreation is that it? And really, okay. So again, what if that is it, though, Julie? Now, again, I would say that the egalitarian, and I don't even like the terms either way. Just be scriptural. I don't know if I've ever said I'm a complementarian. Uh, if you focus so much on that, you're probably not. <laughs> uh, you're just trying to like virtue signal. That's my estimation, anyway. But what if God did make us just for procreation? Because he wanted to. Why did God make gravity do a certain thing on certain objects? Why did he make this and that? Why did he make in create in six consecutive literal 24-hour cycles? How does that work? Well, it says that God created the light on day one, but then he assigns the light to the sun and stars on day four. Because remember, the stars and the sun aren't light. They produce light. Light is some sort of substance that is extra, that's different than the sun itself, right? Because a candle, your phone, your computer a flashlight, that's all producing light. That's not the sun. So the sun isn't light, it makes light. So there's no problem here to have solar days, 24 hour cycles. A plain reading of the text of scripture says it was six days rested on the seventh day. We see this multiple places repeated, including Exodus 20. Why should you have a Sabbath? Because God created in six days and rested on the seventh day. Because he was tired? No, because he's setting a pattern. Because he's an orderly God. It really wasn't until I was in my 40s. And I grew up my whole life in the church. My parents were missionaries, went to a Christian school, working at a Bible college. Okay, so right? she you know, talks so... about the theology of the body. And there's some good in that. And that's fine. We're going to go ahead of this a little bit more. You can watch this whole thing. I'll put it in the description if you want to check it out. Glorifying the body, the Holy Spirit glorifies both. And there's no competition. In it. There's no hierarchy in that sense, as we think of it, because we think of it in a very fallen way. But you see in there that each glories in their unique role that they have within that trinity. But it's, it's one that is without oppression. It's one that is beautifully harmonious. And it's fruitful and life-giving. And then you, you go forward to, to Ephesians 5. And then we see that one flesh union is referenced again. But this time the one flesh union is a reflection of Christ's relationship with the church. And so really marriage, I began to realize that marriage are the book ends of scripture. Scripture begins with a wedding. It ends with a wedding feast. And it's a great metaphor to understanding everything in between. And so if you want to understand why marriage, why gender and sexuality is so under So yeah. So I mean, again, that's true. That's very true, right? It starts with the marriage, ends with the marriage. Like, yeah. Great. The marriage supper of the lamb, Christ and his church, talk about Ephesians five. This mystery is great, but I'm talking about Christ and the church because he's talking about man and woman marriage. Remember, Jesus says there is no marriage in heaven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, right. That's all good. Let her finish. Under assault right now. I'm going to go in another minute. This is the so. primary way we understand God. This is the primary way we understand how we relate to God. So, of course, Satan would be attacking it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I understand what she's getting at. That's I, I, not a uh, primary way we understand God. Like, not really. Not, not, not really. So to get back to your question, how does that, how does that translate into roles and what we do? Well, I think first it, okay, this is the point. When we understand the big picture and what we're meant to be as male and female, that becomes the primary. And then the, the roles, the gender roles are really there just to preserve the integrity of that symbol. 
that we're to reflect the world. So in our church, our church is different. I'm Anglican. So um, in our church, we can actually preach and teach and do a lot of the, you know, can use their gifts in a variety of ways. What we can't do is perform the sacramental role. We can do a lot of different things. We can use our gifts. Okay, so, but here's the thing. Again, Julie, the God who made you be a woman and do all the woman stuff, just like he made my wife, my daughters, my mother, my sister, do those things. He made me and men like me to preach the gospel weekly, consistently, or even more than weekly. Again, we're not talking about a pulpit. We're not talking about a suit or not a suit or pews or chairs or anything like that. We're talking about the ordered gathering, ordered gathering of a body of believers, the church, so-called, right? Whether it's in a building, whether it's in a school, whether it's outside, whether it's on the beach, whether it's in a forest, doesn't matter. It's the gathered assembly of people to say, we're going to proclaim Christ. And there's different ways that happens through giving, through singing, through the proclamation of the gospel, through the reading of the word. All of that is worship, not just music, all of it's worship. Okay. And so because that's all worship, pastors are really the worship leader. That's another video. The God who made that made you have, have a uterus and be able to carry a woman, carry a woman, carry a baby, you know, a future woman or man. It's, it's amazing. And, 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 and all sorts of just wonderful, intricate, crazy stuff that's just beyond our wildest physical imagination, right? God is so detailed, so specific. And yet for the church, ah, it's fine. Be an egalitarian. Like, so she's functionally an egalitarian. And well, but we can't do the sacraments. We're going to look at this right now. As in um, officiating communion, we can never do that. Why? Well, because the person who's doing that, we would view that person as a stand-in for God, for, for Jesus. I mean, it's a Christ figure. And God is always masculine in relation to us. Because God always initiates, we always respond. That's why he is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And so those kind of sacramental roles would be reserved for a priest. So we don't have female priests for that reason, because that's a really important sacramental role. But there's a really beautiful thing in our church. And I think every church... Okay. She talks about the mothers of the church, fathers of the church, that whole thing. Uh, so this is where the whole phrase, the difference isn't between the truth and lies or falsehood. The truth is between... Or the difference is between truth and almost truth. Okay. So she said a lot of true stuff. And this this first section that we just watched is in the beginning part of the video. And I wanted to just show you. I'm not trying to bash Julie Royce. Now, she's got plenty of other problems going on. And she's not just reporting the facts, as she says. She's, she's not. She's just not. But nobody does. You're biased, friend. So am I. I said this when I did the MacArthur Julie Royce video. And people are like, this is such a biased video. It's like, <laughs> I said I was biased. <laughs> Because I'm human. I'm a man, not a woman. I'm my age. I'm not something else. I'm light-skinned. I'm from California, living in Kentucky. Like, there's all these things that I have as a bias that I may or may not add to the conversation. But ultimately, the truth is the truth. The truth is that men are to be called to lead their families and lead their local church. Okay? The local gathered body of believers. But specifically, <laughs> specifically. We need to look at the sacraments. I, I, I don't I don't understand what she's saying, right? I'm a Baptist slash just a Christian, right? I'm Baptist because I'm Baptistic and that's just my conviction. Uh, believers baptism, the whole thing, church autonomy, that's kind of the two things. I'll probably talk about I should I should hash that out because I know there's a lot of Southern Baptists in here. There's a lot of people who hate the Southern Baptist Convention or just Baptists in general. And there's people who have no idea what they're what it is. So stand in, you search stand in just for fun, search stand in, pull me up here, search stand in, it's, it's, it's not there, right? There's no, there's no stand in for God. There's Esther standing in the court, men standing in the temple, stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house in Jeremiah, standing in the road, the drawn sword, standing in the road, standing, now stand, now stand, stand in the house of the Lord. But this is just talking about uh, worship. Hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. Hello. It's like the word faith people. Praise God. Hello. Sorry. Sorry. That's another video. That was just a tongue, by the way. You got a little sample. <laughs> sorry. I get carried away. I know. I shouldn't make fun of the 
fake tongue speaking people. But anyway, so there, there's no stand in for God. There, that's not what communion, Lord's Supper, Eucharist, the Lord's table, whatever you want to call it. The word is Eucharisto, which is where we get Eucharist from. They transliterate it. Uh, same thing where we get the word presbyter or presbyterian. Uh, it's It comes from episkopos, which is transliterated from the Greek. They're all the same word. Elder, pastor, bishop, presbyter. They're all the same. Newsflash. They're all the same. And they're all always men. I know. I said it. That chafes against my own. Oh, it makes me makes my tummy hurt. My second wave feminist ideals that I've been swimming in my whole life that I'm trying to not drown. I read this every Lord's Supper. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because you, when you come together, so he's commending them for doing these certain things, talking about head coverings. He's talking about praying. He's talking about these other things. And he's commending them. But I don't commend them in this. Uh-oh. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. In the first place, you come as a church, right? Gathered body. I hear that some of the divisions, and I believe in part. So there must be factions among you. Remember, the Corinthian church had many factions. This is the one, oh, I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Christ. Right? I just follow Jesus. You ever hear that? Uh-huh. The Jesus people were probably the best people. Sorry. When you come together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For eating, one goes ahead to his own meal and goes hungry, and another gets drunk. What? Right? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Do you not despise the church and humiliate those who have nothing? Right? So there's great wealth and great poverty in Corinth, and people are abusing this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, and then on the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And he given thanks. And he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After saying, taking the cup, after supper, saying, this is the cup in the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink it, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner is guilty of body and blood of the Lord. All right, let's keep looking. Where's that stand in? Where are we talking about? Where, where does it say women can't do this or men can only do this? I don't know. I don't know. Let's look. Let a person examine himself, then eat the bread and drink the cup. So a person, right? It's not just for men, it's for women. But who's officiating? Well, it doesn't really say. More on that in a moment. For anyone who eats the bread and drinks the cup without discerning the body, notice God cares about the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Some scriptures say fallen asleep. But we judged ourselves truly. If we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we are not condemned along with the world. So notice discipline, discipline. God is disciplining you just like he disciplines. A father disciplines his children. Our heavenly father disciplines us sometimes. It's a big deal. It matters, right? It's not just, oh, God doesn't like me. No, not at all. It's rather God disciplines you so you're not condemned with the world. So you don't slip into the quicksand of death. That's why. So that's in 1 Corinthians Jesus is starting it. Paul's referencing this in his Corinthian letter to Luke's letter, chapter 22. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. I love the KJV. And gave it unto them. This is why I advocate more than one translation, because you don't want it to just be an echo chamber of one translation. Read three or four or five translations off and on. Have, have a steady one. ESV, NASB, King James if you really want, but it, I find it difficult to read sometimes. Um, but it's still very, very helpful. New King James, maybe a little better for you. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup after supper saying, this is the cup in the New Testament is the New Testament in my blood or new covenant, right? That's all it means. Testament covenant, same thing, which is shed for you. Behold, the hand that betrayeth me is at on the table. Correct. Okay. So. Christ is instituting this. It's Lord's Supper. We read this. Here it is. Paul reaffirms this. Okay, so it's a practice. Doesn't say how often we should do it. Doesn't say anything. But it doesn't have any sort of stand-in. It doesn't have any sort of sacrament stand-in. Here we go. Sacrament. Here's another thing right here. Sacrament. So even the Roman Catholic Church believes marriage is a sacrament. Well, it's not. In fact, this great sacrament, I guess this is where they get it from, the KJV, most likely is what this is, 532. I don't even know where that is. Sac. 
Dewey Rames Bible. Really? That's weird. So it's not even in the scripture. It's not even in the King James. Talking about marriage. So this is Ephesians 5 that Julie Royce mentions. This great mystery. But I regard Christ in the church. So he's talking about it's a mystery that men and women get married, make babies, enjoy their lives. Or should, right? Unto the glory of God. That's great. That's a mystery. And it is a mystery, isn't it? Men, women. If he would just, if she would just, right? God has a sense of humor, as they say. This is why actually being uh, same-sex attracted and acting on those passions is actually easier. I know, ooh, that's harsh. But that's easier because you know you know the playbook, right? It's difficult to understand the opposite sex. It's work. But God made us for such. He made us for such. I know, this video is just all sorts of demonetization. But I'm not monetized, so it doesn't matter. It'll probably get demonetized at some point once I get monetized. Anyway, like and subscribe if you have not already. I'm trying to I'm trying to get there. Uh, help me to get to a thousand subscriptioners. Please, please, please. But, so there's no sacrament. She's talking about sacrament. The, the Lord's table isn't a sacrament. It's not a sacrament. Luke 22, commentary on it is 1 Corinthians 11. And let's just look at this real quick and where we get this heinous, evil, patriarchal wickedness, this complementarian nonsense. What's interesting, though, there's also patriarchal or patriarchy uh, that people will are shedding the complementarian role or name and saying, oh, I'm a patriarch, I'm, I'm patriarchal, etc. Fine, I don't care. I'm not going to use any of those terms. Honestly, I'm really not. Uh, and maybe that annoys some people, but that's okay. That's what I'm here to do. 1 Timothy 2, a woman, and this is NIV, so this is the more kind of paraphrasal, not quite as literal. Sometimes they change the gendered language a little bit, although this is Bible Hub. They're not going to have the brand new NIV. This is 2011. There's a newer NIV that's really, really bad. A woman should learn all quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was first formed that Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a sinner or fell into transgression. All right. Notice that it says nothing about gifts, right? So it doesn't matter whether you're gifted or you think you're gifted to preach the Bible and be a pastor and be a week-to-week -week gal in the pulpit. Many other churches have shed that and not drawn the line as a sacramental thing. Oh, you can do all these things, but you can't perform communion. As if communion's more important than preaching the word of God? No, it's not. It's a remembrance, as the scripture says, and it's a proclamation. It's not Jesus' body or blood. It's not his stuff. It doesn't transfigure. That would have gotten me burnt at the stake 500 years ago. I'm not kidding. Like, it is a memorial. It's a proclamation. Yes, Christ is everywhere, but he's not around the host. I mean, there's a whole transubstantiation, uh, uh, subconsubstantiation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This has to do with Christ and the church. This has to do with Adam and Eve. It goes back to creation. So when you have a wrong view of creation, Adam and Eve were just apes. They were just this. They were just that. It doesn't matter. Then you look at these other passages, Romans 5, 1 Timothy 2, other places. You scratch your head. And I guarantee you. Everybody who's a feminist or egalitarian who says men and women are different, doesn't matter. They also have a deficient, negative slash sinful understanding of creation, of who Adam and Eve are, and everything else. It goes back to what you believe about the past, the present, and the future. It goes back to your theology. Your theology matters. Julie Roy's theology is good in certain areas. I will say that. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say that. But there's other areas that are woefully deficient and on their way to being just straight sinful. This doesn't go back to gifts. This doesn't go back to anything. This goes back to the creation order. Okay? And even if this is a husband and wife and not man and woman, because you can translate them differently, the, the application is exactly the same. Hope you found this helpful. This went a little longer. Love you all. Have a great day. Um, I'm pre-recording this one. And so I'm actually going to be at, as this drops, at the Conservative Baptist Network conference, Bible conference in Memphis. Hopefully going to be doing some interviews or something from there. We'll see, or maybe some just shorts, uh, but either way, it'll be fun. And uh, y'all take care.
and help me to get to that next mark, that next goal of a thousand subscribers. I uh, just passed 500. Help me to get there, please. If you've not subscribed, please, please, please do so. If you want to support me, you can buy me a cup of coffee. Drop me a little tip there. You can be a monthly uh, supporter. Once I get some more things, I'm going to get some content, some behind the scenes things and share that with the supporters. There you'll get a, a direct link that is not shared on YouTube and a few other things as well. So that's at buymeacupofcoffee.com slash Richard Contra. Buymeacupofcoffee.com slash Richard Contra. It's like Patreon. Y'all take care.